So how did the concept of the meta disk um, even come to life? It just seems like a very unique solution. You know? Yeah, yeah. So the first thing to understand is that it wasn't kind of developed in isolation from absolutely nothing. Uh, we've got quite a diverse team here, of different engineers with different backgrounds. And one of our guys had a background where he'd been involved with metamaterials before. So he was already aware of the field and what people were, were playing around with. Um, and he was the first person to say that he thought if we used a metamaterial behind a tweeter, it could do something really interesting for acoustics. So we immediately then started to look around at uh, what other people were doing to try and find what structures might work and mm -hmm. identified uh, this company based in Hong Kong, which is called the Advanced Metamaterials Group, and, and then you know, went to visit them, uh, established a great working relationship, and then you know, the, it was kind of collaborative uh, at that point. And they already had the kind of theory behind the absorber uh, and they were using it already for like industrial noise control applications. Right. Um, and kind of that already told us it needed to have uh, lots of different channels. All the channels had to be different lengths. And, and, and some of the difficulty of then how we uh, implemented it was kind of packing. And, you know, the disc... Geometry works really nicely in the space we had. Yep. And then when you know you start to pack different length tubes into that geometry, it just starts yeah, to yeah, look yeah. like a maze. Of and, course. Yeah. Uh, so it kind of fell out through through the collaboration. You know, that wasn't the idea on day one, let's make a maze. <laughs> the, the idea on yep. day one was like, let's see if we can use a metamaterial. And, right, and that's what, what what it came out with. Yeah. So yeah, a little bit backwards from how it looks from the outside, I guess. Yeah, yeah. And and so like how long did that process take from the idea to actual uh, development? Well, I think, you know, if you break it down into stages, there was a kind of an initial, will this do anything useful? How how could we do this? What are the partners? Uh, that's always a little bit drawn out because yeah. you've, you know, you, it's kind of peripheral, that kind of discussion that goes on. I think the key moment was the first time we made contact with AMG and then when Sebastian went out and visited them. And, um, you know, they're a, a young company. They've been... Um, recently founded, the guys who founded them were working on metamaterial technology um, for their PhDs. Mm. And uh, we had a good kind of rapport immediately. I think, you know, they could see that we were very serious about um, using the technology authentically. Uh, and so they were very happy um, for us to kind of uh, take their concept and, and, and integrate it. Um, okay. So yeah, the whole process was, I mean, in product terms, relatively quick, but in real terms, you know, it's probably sure. like 18 months from actually visiting them to having product. In yeah, the market. right, right. right. Um, okay. Yeah, but um, yeah, a really interesting one because as well, there's always that thing of saying, well, how much, how much is this going to actually make a difference? Because yeah. um, on paper, it certainly uh, ticked all the boxes of saying, well, this is going to really give us much more um, absorption of the rear mm. wave. It, you know, uh, there's nothing out there that can do better than this. We knew it would be a lot better than the kind of best on the market. Mm. But until, you, you know, you get it into a prototype and listen to you it, just you, don't you just know, don't right? know. Yeah. So on the tour of the KEF factory today, I've seen some amazing engineering capabilities in modeling and simulation. Were you able to model and measure the metamaterial disk in isolation outside of a speaker? Yeah, yeah. Oh, well. That's something we definitely wanted to do because the the theory is fairly clear cut um, for that, um, but there are some little wrinkles when you implement it that um, could upset the whole thing and stop it working. Uh, so the theory says you've got to have lots of channels, they've got to be tuned to different lengths, and also that the energy will be dissipated just by viscosity, so you don't need any foam or right. anything like that. Um, but when we come to actually make the part and we're folding the channels, we need to make sure that doesn't influence the performance. Mm. Um, and the way that the part's put together, it's quite easy to get leakage between the walls so that you wouldn't then have closed channels anymore. They'd have little air gaps. Um, so we wanted to make sure we had a way to verify the actual part was working. And, and it was very worthwhile because we did get air leaks and we had to change the construction slightly to fix right, that. Right, right. Okay. Um, yeah. And the other thing that was really good for that is it, it meant that we knew exactly, you know, that, the, that it was working. When, when we're then listening, you know, you know what you're listening to is the genuine thing. It, you're not kidding yourself. It's something else. Mm. And, and it's great as well. You know, we, we published um, some AES papers on it and we could include those measurements to show the thing really working, yep. not just have the simulated data. Wow, okay. 
In the release of the LS series, most recently the LS60, Kef seems to be going down the route of making audio systems for the masses rather than just specifically for audiophiles only. How does this influence your audio engineering choices? And is there such a thing as a speaker for an audiophile versus a non-audiophile? Yeah, that's an interesting question. It's the answers may be a little bit complicated, but my my experience is that if you take people who haven't heard like a really good hi-fi and you play them a really good hi-fi, they're extremely impressed straight away. They're kind of bowled over. Mm. And in a lot of cases, you kind of get the impression that they didn't realize that you could get sound quality as good as that. Um, so I, I don't think you need to make a kind of product aimed at people like that sound much different from uh, a kind of hi-fi audio file, so to speak. Okay. The difference is in the kind of access, I think, because if you're, um, you know, how, if you kind of ask, well, how, how do people get into hi-fi? You have to be exposed to it at some point. Mm. And I think for most of us who are into hi-fi, that was probably because you had a friend or a family member who had a hi-fi. Very true. So then you're kind of like aware that this world exists and then, you know, it's aspirational for you to kind of save up and maybe buy a first hi-fi mm. and then you're on the upgrade route. Um, I think there's a lot of people that doesn't exist for who could still be really into like good quality reproduced music. Um, so those guys love music already. That's got to be a given. Yep. They're probably listening to it somehow, right? So it's headphones, it's Bluetooth speakers, that kind of thing. Yep. So they're very used to this kind of whole level of convenience um, that comes with mass market consumer goods um, that to an extent hi-fi enthusiasts are willing to forego a little that's bit. That's true, yeah. Um, so for me, that's the key thing is like, actually, you don't need to give them a better experience than an audio file system. That is already, you know, a pinnacle that they can, you know, immediately see the benefit of. But they're not going to go from a standing start to suddenly wanting to buy a separate source, a separate amp, a separate speakers, you know, choose their own cables and, and all of that. I, I feel like they need something which is more or less plug and play. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so that's kind of the LS, really. You can buy that system um, without having anything at home other than you know, a Wi-Fi connection. Yeah, yeah. You get home and you can have it up and running in 20 minutes. And it gives you that kind of level of performance that you know, an audio file would be proud to have. Mm. So that, that's really it for me. It's that accessibility. Okay. Um, there's maybe a little bit more to it than that, that you know, in the audio file world, we're used to some things that other people wouldn't maybe be prepared to do or wouldn't even occur to them. So mm. like moving your speakers into careful positions, yes, yep. um, you know, setting up your your listening seat and, and your listening room. So there's a little bit of an extra bit there is saying that you kind of newcomers um, will want something that works well irrespective of where they put it. Mm. Um, and, and there's a little bit that we can do to help them out on that, right? Because a traditional passive system, you can't tweak that much. Um, but on an active um, smart system with streaming, we've got lots of controls yes. we can offer and, and an app to make it easy for them to do that. So, mm. yeah, but you don't have to do too much different. Good sound is good sound for everyone. Yeah. And just from a speaker voicing angle, the LS50 wireless to me sounds a bit more hi-fi to channel, whereas the LSX2 and the LS60 in particular sound a bit more consumery. Is that just the way it came out or was that intentional? Um, how much thought goes into that? speaker voicing process? Uh, well, that that is maybe just how it's come out because of the, the, the background of the product. So okay. the, the, the LS50 uh, Wireless 2, the acoustics are heavily based on the LS50 Meta, which right. is you know classic hi-fi design. And we didn't want to stray too far from that voicing. So they're quite similar products. Mm. The LS50 W2, you know, with DSP, um, and with a lot of power to control the LMF, we can push it a bit further. Yeah, okay. Um, LSX2, you know, you, there isn't a passive version to compare with. Right. Um, yeah, yeah. It's also a kind of product that tends to be, you know, used um, either in the near field or on kind of a countertop, that kind of thing. So that changes how we approach the balance. So we try to make it sound good in those situations. So maybe it's because of that. Mm. And I think the thing with the LS60 is, for me, that's kind of a, different approach because with the other two products you could make passive versions of the LSX2 and we do on the LS50 but the LS60 you can't you mm. know it's designed in a way that it has to be active um, 
you know, that's great because it means we offer like much bigger sound than you think you would be getting from that size product. Um, but it does give the sound a bit of a different characteristic as well. So that kind of deep but very very controlled bass, it, yeah. I I really really like. But I you don't it. you don't find that from ported passive speakers. True, sure. yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. I think that if you take like a kind of consumer who's come from Bluetooth and headphones, mm. the one thing that those products always try and deliver is lots of bass. Yes. Right? Yeah. And and with hi-fi some of the kind of audio file segment really isn't interested in that yes yeah. so you've got products like all those kind of miniature monitors and and to an extent you could say well ls50 meta can fall into that category right. they prioritize all the other aspects of sound you know like you know kind of transparency vocal yes. clarity smoothness but they give up on that kind of bottom up octave and i do have a feeling that newcomers and less willing to give up on that bottom octave. And they're more into things like, you know, the LS60 with a closed box, deep extended bass, mm. or adding subwoofers uh, to something like an LSX2 or a LS50W2. So yeah. that is a, a kind of a little bit of a difference in yeah. priority. Um, so speakers have traditionally been for music only, um, with them becoming much more of a multi-purpose entertainment solution. And this is even more emphasized by the all-in-one actives. How does that change your design approach, if it does at all? Yeah, it's something that we can accommodate because it's active. We can we don't have to have it so it sounds the same um, in all scenarios. So, you know, we still don't change what we're trying to do as a kind of baseline. Okay. So the baseline, when you take out the product and plug it in, is to deliver the best possible sound we can, and that's not really any different from passive and active. But you know, obviously. As soon as you've got a kind of HDMI input on there, you've got very high likelihood you've got lots of customers plugging that into a TV. And when they're using their TV, very little of the time are they kind of in critical listening mode. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they'll be in that mode, you know, if they've got uh, kind of music, um, music videos, music DVDs, that kind of thing. But if you uh, are just kind of using it for normal TV watching, sometimes you want to emphasize different parts of the audio just to good, good like usability at low levels um, or good clarity on vocals and things like that. So yeah, it, it, it's something that we have kind of thought about. Mm -hmm. um, the other aspect is like low quality sources to an extent. We, we haven't always done it, but some products um, we've given a slightly different um, balance on the Bluetooth input, oh, for okay. example, because you kind of know the quality of the source isn't going to be. I mean, you can still get very transparent Bluetooth transmission, but you also know it's not going to be like streaming from yeah, yeah. you know tidal or, or Cobuzz or whatever. Yep. Um, so we can do that, and it's something that in the future we may do more. We may do more of. Okay, and can you control that if, say, you are streaming a lower quality source through uh, Wi-Fi and, and and not Bluetooth? We, well, with Active, um, where you've got the streaming built into the speaker, you, you know, we can do anything <laughs> to an extent. Sure. We don't want to kind of be too heavy-handed. So, at the moment, we haven't done kind of any um, kind of dynamic stuff that just steps in and control stuff for you okay um i think it'll be interesting to see if if people want that but it's something we've thought about um yeah so you know reacting to the sample rate for example but i mean even if you take stream streaming audio lossless streaming audio at um say redbook cd that's mm. already like yeah. really high quality and audio files in in the kind of the 90s and 2000s that was all we could get right mm. <laughs> and you could put together a fantastic hi-fi system like that. So I don't think you need to do anything for those. Okay. It's, it's more like um, low quality uh, live TV broadcast or something yep. like that, where you might struggle to hear the dialogue or or if you've got very low bit rate MP3. Yeah, yeah, like sure, that. sure. Yeah, and just to touch on a point um, that you just raised, um, given that they're active, you can do anything. Is that freeing to you as a speaker designer or a burden? Oh no, it's freeing. Okay. It's freeing, I mean, uh, yeah, it's unusual in a way to get your head into a different mode. Mm. Uh, but you know, we're so used to developing passive products um, that you know, developing an active one gives you a lot more freedom. Mm. Um, it's interesting. I think I think 
passive products have been around for so long that we've had to find ways to improve them without going active. Mm. So I sometimes wonder, you know, if, if active had been widely adopted 20 years ago, would our driver development just have stopped because yeah, you know, sure. we'd feel like there were other things we could do. Yeah, because um, like active that's big is almost um, taboo like 10, 15 years ago, like in, in, the, in, yeah, the, in, in the audio file circle. Uh, right? To an extent, they just you just didn't see them. Yeah. Um, they were, you know, kind of the standard for pro audio, though. Yes, and they have been for a long time. Yeah. Um, so those guys, you know, have been taking advantage of that a lot, um, but probably emphasizing very different things from what audiophiles are interested in. Yeah, so that that's strange. But there are all these kind of new um, parameters, I guess. And, and, yeah, you have to kind of find how to use them the best way to give you you know, a, a big step up in performance. And sure, you can make it worse if you're not careful. Yeah. Um, and different companies have used it in different ways. Mm. So yeah, it's it's exciting. And, yeah. and I think there are more, many more possibilities in the future too. Just from an aesthetic design angle, if I think back to say the KEF XQ series from 12, 13 years ago, the previous generation reference speakers, they all incorporated a lot more curves and chamfers. Whereas most of the speakers that we're seeing from KEF these days, you know, the current R series, the reference, the L60, they're all rectangular boxes. How much does a design aesthetic play in the development of speakers? Uh, yeah, it's a good question. We are putting products into people's living rooms. Mm. Um, I mean, we've just seen the product museum and uh, I think even from day one, you can see it's really important um, that a KEF product looks great. Uh, okay, tastes have changed, so yes. some of those you might not want. But um, it's it's got to be a balance between you know uh, acoustics and and design. That's really a un one of the you know, things that sets KEF apart is we aspire to have very very high quality design. I there's always a kind of conversation that goes on between our internal design team and acoustics team to get that balance right. Things like the curvy cabinets versus the kind of more rectilinear that we have now, the acoustic differences between them are, are there, but there are also things where we can find ways to engineer our way around it. Um, I mean, people often talk about, oh, you know, curved cabinets, surely they're better for standing waves, but the reality isn't quite that simple. There's standing waves even in curved, <laughs> yeah. curved cabinets. The rigidity is very nice that you get from the curved mm -hmm. cabinets, but on the other hand, we can add rigidity with you know bracing, with some of the clever techniques we talked about for vibration yes. control. So generally, you know, it's this balance that we're trying to strike. We want to make desirable products from all aspects, and if you just asked us to make the best possible thing acoustically, you wouldn't hit that. Mm. Um, I mean, there are red lines where we just will say to the designer, if we do that, it's not going to perform well enough. And likewise, there are things that we, you know, would propose, and it'll be, you know, kind of say, well, can you come up with an alternative? Yes. Because, yep. Yeah. So it's a conversation. Um, yep. Yeah. It's an important part of our DNA is is getting that right. Yeah. Okay.